Hi, this is your host, Abdul Bhartiya, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rack. And today we are going to talk about uh, open source. It's end of the year. So many things happened this year in the open source world, uh, whether it's license change, whether it's community building or you know, security, you know, Lockshell is there. So, uh, Rob, if I ask you, you know, uh, if you reflect on 2021, What's going on with open source? Uh, how things are changing? Things are getting better. Things are getting worse. Talk about it. You know, I, I think, and you know, you need to include the log for J challenge in in this whole whole thing. I think that you know people are looking at log, at open source as not the answer to every problem, which is potentially the most healthy thing that we can have. You know, we've we started a couple of years ago with this idea that open source was going to solve every problem. Every, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too, right? I, I've written, you know, very breathy blog posts saying, you know, open source and collaboration and Git, GitHub are the answer to every every one of society's problems. And I, I think that we are coming back with a measure of pragmatism in how open source should be working. And we're asking some real questions about, you know, how the open source communities are governed, how their, the patches go, how the security is going. Um, you know what? How these these projects are being sustained, and I, I think it's a it's a much more pragmatic state for open source than it has been in the past. When you said you know that we are thinking open source is going to solve problems, uh, I think we have had this discussion earlier, and I run a show with Dirk on that VMware as well, where sometimes people do confuse open source with the uh, business model the fact is that it's a collaboration model it's uh, you know depending on the license you use it it can uh, dictate who can collaborate or not with you how you build business is totally different thing just like cooking right you can have your own but, but how do you sell that pizza is a totally different thing so uh, a lot of you know whether you look uh, i mean if you look at all the company that evolved if they had to write all the code by themselves it would have taken them decades, you know. So open source democratics, you know, is getting started. Then we talk about cloud, public cloud, private cloud. That also helps with the infrastructure part. You know, we don't have to build. So how has open source contributed uh, to, you know, emergence of new companies who can, you know, I mean, it doesn't take months or years to start a new tech company these days. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a whole set of interesting components with this, right? Because Linux was, you know, major... Uh, 30 year anniversary. Um, and, you know, so we, we get to a point where some things we're just taking for granted, but even Linux is showing challenges with, you know, what, what Red Hat did with CentOS and converting it to streams and spinning out two new distros based on the CentOS upstreams. Um, you know, I, I think that it is important to think of open source as a you know, development model where you have communities helping do development. It's it's also, and as much, an ecosystem model where you build up an ecosystem, right? We should include HashiCorp going public, um, and one of the, you know, as it, you know, and they're they're putting the word open source company quite a bit. The tools they build are open. Most of the tools they have are HashiCorp products, uh, you know, and and they they maintain control of that. It's a very different model than you get with, say. Uh, CNCF with Kubernetes, where there's a foundation model. And, and we actually saw some people, some companies in that model, um, Knative specifically, go back into governance with the CNCF. So, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a muddy challenge here. There are places where you can get a very big market and create a lot of use by having an open source project or product that you give away for free. Um, and there's also times when having a whole bunch of people collaborating around that project is the secret to its success. It also can create some confusion. CNCF has reached a point with the landscape and with the number of companies, that, the number of projects, some of them single company projects that they incubate into CNCF, that you know people are starting to get confused about what is a required project, you know what is what it takes to get into that incubation phase. Is it necessary? Um, what they need to pay attention to, and that's that's a that's a challenging perspective um, from a market from a user's 
model. Let's also talk about you know, one of the biggest communities these days, of, I think after Linux uh, community, the community that we talk a lot about these days is Kubernetes. And I, I, I recorded a show with somebody uh, and they said that in 2022, Kubernetes more or less become like what Linux is to general application, Kubernetes will become to cloud native applications. Uh, so uh, if we just look at Kubernetes ecosystem, the communities, any any changes, uh, what, what are you seeing there? So. I, you know, I think that we are starting to look at the Kubernetes infrastructure system as complex. I see this a lot. Um, and it's, it is also in some ways a automatic ticket at the moment. So I see a lot of places where people have a green light to build things in Kubernetes or on top of Kubernetes, which is very healthy for an ecosystem. So you can come to market as a Kubernetes product and not be questioned. Um, which means that Kubernetes has reached a critical mass for how things are going. The, the challenge is, as, as, since there are no breaks at the moment in that model, we are going to start getting back into a point where you know, companies start saying, wait a second, just because you've done it in Kubernetes doesn't make it a good thing, or that I know how to sustain it or manage it or things like that. Um, and so I think that we're, we're getting into the life cycle where not everything built on Kubernetes is automatically should automatically be considered good. Uh, and and that is, I think, a healthy part of how these things go. I also think that we're we're seeing, and I see this quite a bit, we're still struggling with how to operate Kubernetes. You know, Amazon at, at reInvent introduced, I think, two different ways that they also will auto scale and manage Kubernetes that are different than what other people in the industry are working on. And the challenge with that just means that it's not settled. Um, you know, I, I don't. I see a couple of big distros that people use, and they don't. They don't necessarily have good answers to long-term operations. Um, and the idea of just let, trusting the cloud providers to manage it for you, which is sort of where thing, things ended in two thousand one, is causing a little bit more angst when you start looking at, say, Amazon having a day-long outage, um, and so. You know, we need to really think through the usability and manageability of these platforms and, and how we're going to sustain them. And this, this is where I would bring in Log4j. Um, some people felt really betrayed by the Log4j, the open source aspects of Log4j, right? This is a, a, a critical vulnerability that's been in the source code for years. And that was not supposed to happen with open source, um, according to some. I actually, software has vulnerabilities. They get discovered. You know, It doesn't matter how many eyeballs you have. We are still going to discover vulnerabilities in software. But I think the thing that I see that, that we forget about in open source is that just because you're using open source, you still have the responsibility for maintaining it, maintaining your version of it, keeping it up to date, patching it, watching it. That's not an open source specific thing. That's a software thing. It's a hardware thing. Um, and so I do think that we get distracted by open source is solving my problems and not thinking through, I still have to be responsible for the operations of this and patching it and running it and doing all these things. Um, and so that's, you know, that's part of what people forget they own, even when they're using open source. And I'll talk about, you know, uh, of course, uh, open source does make it easy, you know, to find bugs and, you know, because the co code is there, anybody can see. And there's also uh, Eric Raymond, I think, said, you know, it's known as a Linux you know, law that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. But the fact is that it doesn't matter how many eyeballs you have, what matters is where you're looking. And you only look where you expect something to be going wrong. So just because code is open source does not mean it is secure. I mean, we all know that there is nothing. But the fact is we need to build in subsystems. Linux Foundation, they have done a lot of work. The Linux kernel community, they have a lot of you know uh, processes in place. But the, the problem that here is happening is some of these open source projects, just having eyeballs does not make it secure. Even having users doesn't. So right, the other, it's, it's eyeballs, but it's also use. And so, right, we can't make the assumption that just because something has a massive ecosystem and it's widely used, um, that it's automatically more secure than something else. And this, this to me is just the illusion that we're operating under, you know, and, and 
this this year pierced the veil in a couple of different ways because it also pierced the veil on the idea that Amazon is better at operating software than you are, right? They are, we know that, but they are operating software in a much more complex environment than you are. So some of their expertise is used up by the fact that they're that they're doing it. But going back to open source, we you know that log for J problem really pierced the veil because you know the idea that just oh, it's a widely used library that's in in code that's got a lot of eyeballs on it, um, and it still is going to have a vulnerability. And and we should all know that just because we fix this one vulnerability and patch it, it's not going to protect us from the next one. Right? There's there's another one. If I ask you from your perspective. Um, since you also deal with customers, paying customers, um, from open source uh, angle, uh, what should open source communities do so that it's not exclusive to you know projects like Linux kernel who do take a lot of work, that there should be some set of best practices, and best practices is a very bad word actually in reality, but so, so, so to ensure that those open source projects, they do have some mechanism in place so that this doesn't happen if we hear about it every year. So, you know, open source is amazing and, and we rely and our customers rely heavily on open source technologies at a very deep level in the stack. Um, and that's good. That's the way it should be. And, and that's, that's part of what our ecosystem has been. None of that technology comes with the processes and practices that ensure that you can update, patch, deploy and fix. Right. Those are those are things that are still on the users that are still on the operators. And, you know, when we look at customers wanting to use open source technologies better, they need to be prepared to update, migrate, change, fix, adapt. I mean, as, a, as an example, and this is this is really critical, open source communities evolve and change. So we have a lot of customers who are using CentOS and are concerned about the CentOS streams migration and have been looking to fall back to a Debian-based distro or look at Rocky or Alma or one of the CentOS alternatives. Okay, it's not a fast migration. They have machines that are already deployed. They have to do, they have to change their tooling. They have to, they, they have to do a lot of work to do that migration. That is not a, a defect of open source, it's a feature of open source. And the challenge is if you want to use those technologies, you have to have invested in ways that you're going to actually improve and change and respond into those systems. And so this is the biggest thing for us and what we see our customers, you know, the good ones understand that they have to adapt. They have to be able to accommodate um, the changes that are going to get thrown at them by using open source and make informed decisions. Um, and in some cases, rely on a vendor to, to cushion that. In some cases where they're, they're choosing not to do it, they, they're going to come back to somebody like us, like RackN, and say, we need the process support, the infrastructure as code, the infrastructure of pipelines to neutralize the, the changes that have to go about. Um, and and that's, it, that's important in any software and infrastructure. It's even more important with open source where there is a higher rate of churn by design. Right. Uh, with open source, the, I mean, the way I look at it, the open source solves day one problem where, you know, you can get started with things, you know, for day two, either you have your in-house resources, which, you know, you may need a lot, or you have to go with a vendor. Uh, uh, there's no other way uh, because, you know, you will end up, it's more or less like, you know, building a business of selling potato chips, but, you know, open source ends with a farm. You know, somebody grew the potatoes, now it's up to you to haul the truck to your store, cut the potatoes, and it's no different than, uh, you know, it gives you the raw ingredients. It's, it's, it's a supply chain, right? This is the thing that I think we've been learning over and over again, you know, is that you need to be aware of the supply chain of your business, right? And the software and the infrastructure is part of that supply chain. And, you know, you can't just outsource it to somebody else and assume everything's good. You have to have a degree of responsibility for that, either by being able to switch vendors or ex adapt to variation from that vendor, or you have to be take responsibility if you're going to a vendor and they, you know, let you down and they disrupt your business. Um, you need to make deliberate supply chain choices all the way down to your Java libraries. And I think that's where, you know, uh, 
players like Rack can play a very critical role, you know, in, in, uh, uh, where companies can get to use whatever open source technology they want to use, but you also kind of enable them by, by, by being a vendor of one throw to choke, uh, make things easier for them so they can focus on adding business value, whereas you focus on keeping the stack in. So that's why I you know the whole ecosystem where you folks play a very critical role in open source. It's not about open source, it's not about code. This is, this is exactly right. I mean, when what we do with an infrastructure pipeline is we put together a lot of pieces um, as a system and take a very system system view of it. And that allows you to roll through changes, right? You, you, you become insulated from changes to HashiCorp or from Linux or from IPMI or Redfish vendors or, you know, hardware, software, or clouds. That degree of, you know, you, we're not taking those out of the picture. You don't, they're good tools individually. What we're, what we're doing is reducing the impact of any one of those components changing or having to change. Um, and yeah, you're right. That's exactly how people need to adapt to open source technology and, and be flexible and ready for you know, the winds to change. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, yeah. of course, the how open source is evolving. It is evolving. That is a fact. And as usual, I'd love to see you back on the show next year, maybe. Thank you.